So obviously you're um, Herb's head of membership, and today you're going to be talking to us about street food by numbers. Um, so what, what's that kind of going to entail? Uh, well, it's just a sort of run through accounting for a street food trader. So it's trying to keep it simple. It's understanding that most people get involved in street food without thinking they're going to have to worry about accounting all the time, but giving them the full uh, breadth of what they need to do in terms of the fact that they're running a business and okay, any good. business needs to use the numbers. Thank. Okay. And you've done this at some of our workshops before. So this is, you know, this is something that is really, really important to people starting their own business. Like if you start this stuff from the beginning, it makes it a lot easier down the line. Definitely. We get, we get a mixture of different businesses. Some people are all about the food and some people are all about the business and all about the numbers. Uh, and today we're just going to focus on that side, but I always aware that the food's got to come first as well. So you just got to use these to your own advantage. Okay. Well, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Uh, so here I am. I'm uh, head of membership for Curb. So I work with all our traders. Uh, I used to be Curb's head of operations and finance. So I come at this from the fact that I, I'm i not a accountant, but I'm a sort of a bookkeeper slash, fi slash finance assistant for Curb. So I've been through a lot of the hurdles and learned the hard way through a lot of things. Uh, and I've also worked with traders like Lika Burger. I was with them right at the start. And I've done bookkeeping for lots of different traders. So I know the pitfalls. I know a lot of the issues that, that come. Uh, today, we're going to talk to talk to everyone who's tuning in uh, about the various financial structures of your business. Like, do you go for sole traders, uh, limited companies? Then we're going to go through your dishes. How do you work out what it's going to cost you? What are the other costs you're not thinking about? And how on earth do you think about controlling any of these things? Uh, thinking about all the other costs that a food business has to pay. What rent should you be paying? And uh, hopefully you'll come out of this talk thinking you'll have the answer to the golden question. How much do you need to invest? First thing that I say to everyone, find an accountant. Get an accountant. You need someone to help you. You're starting a business, uh, and if you don't have any knowledge, even people who have been accountants in different industries have ended up seeking accountants who know this industry. So I really recommend trying to find someone who knows the hospitality industry, whether or not it's a cafe, restaurant, bar, club. There's lots of different variations, but find an accountant. I cannot stress that enough. Oh, uh What's what's the easiest way to find an accountant, Rob? You can talk to people. Often, word of mouth is one of the best ways. So you can go join our Curb uh, Slack channels or uh, go online, go through Xero, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute, which is an accounting software. They have a link to finding accountants that work with Xero. Uh, and I, to be honest, I think the best way is to talk to people you know. And even if you know no one with a hospitality business, a restaurant or a cafe, they will know someone and you will find a good contact through that. Uh, then, once you've got an accountant, talk to them and get an accounting system. Uh, it's been a revolution in, uh, in the way that people can do their own accounts. I mean, it used to be that you'd have to write everything in a big logbook. Uh, and it would be, feel very sort of like a monk writing out the Bible. Uh, now it's all online, all cloud-based. You can access it any time. Uh, people still use Excel documents. I would I would, I stay away from that now, especially with this new thing called Making Tax Digital, which is essentially a way of filing your tax returns online. It, everything's much easier through an accounting system. I recommend Zero because it's the one that I've worked with the most and I really like it. Uh, it's it's built for small businesses and as you get larger, it's got loads of capabilities to be able to work what you need uh, as, as you get to multiple um, hundreds of thousands or millions of turnover, you can still use this system. Uh, it's really fantastic, uh, but it does take some time to get used to. So you talk to an accountant and see if you can get someone to help you set up the system. Because once you're set up and you understand it, it will save you so much time and give you the information about your business that you need. Uh, it It's pretty cheap. Most of these packages are about 20 to 30 pounds a month and they will save you that money and some. Uh, 
Zero and Receipt Bank work well. So what Zero is, is essentially all your accounts online uh, and it links to your bank statement. So you know what transactions to name in certain ways. What Receipt Bank does is when you're out and about, and most traders are, they're driving from bookers to uh, the local Sainsbury's because they run out of lettuce. Uh, they're searching for all different things uh, and spending money uh, on God knows what. About Quite often you'll, you'll see about 10 transactions a day. It's not the best way to do things. You want to try and limit those transactions. But if you do need to spend money, Receipt Bank's great because you take a picture of that receipt, it goes straight into a pot, it will scan the receipt, and it allows you to deal with all your receipts at once in a very clear, concise way. So it, rather than having that horrible box of receipts, and anyone watching this has already got street food business, I bet you've already got that cupboard or shoe box or drawer that's just full of receipts. You can remove that from your life and that horrible sort of dragon under the carpet. Uh, so you don't have to think, when am I going to deal with this awful thing? It does it for you, and it, it makes it a lot less difficult. Can't recommend it enough. And you have everything logged. And especially with VAT, which, which we'll talk to you about later, it means that you keep all those VAT receipts, and you can claim that money back. So getting your receipts tidy will make you money. Okay. So, Rob, basically, zero is just like categorizing where your money comes in and where it goes out, like from, uh, from something at Sainsbury's to even much bigger purchases. Yes, it's every single penny that comes out of your bank account and goes into your bank account. What Zero does, it allows you to code it correctly, uh, which which I can talk to you about how that's done. Uh, and that's through something called the chart of accounts. Uh, and while this looks quite complicated with lots of numbers and names, it is essentially you naming expenditure and, and, and income and putting it in different pots. So essentially, if you spend money at Sainsbury's, you're saying, that's a cost of my sale, that's a cost of product on food. Uh, if you spend money on petrol, you could put that in the petrol pot or the travel pot, depending on what you want, how you spend your money. Uh, if you have, if you're mainly just selling one item at one type of uh, event, you might just put sales. A lot of people just do that. I recommend doing that at the beginning, especially a street food business. You don't want to be trying to take your income and expenditure and, and break it down into too many complex categories. Just keep it simple. So if you get money in, that's your sales. If you spend money on food and packaging, money that goes into your product, which we'll break down a bit later, uh, that goes into cost of sales. And then you break down your rents, uh, other things. If you've got professional fees, if you have like maintenance contracts and various things like that, you can put them in different categories. And that's what... Uh, Zero allows you to do really easily uh, because you set it up. And I recommend, again, talk to your accountant, get it set up, uh, and just make sure that you understand what all these different categories are. Uh, and they all have different codes in Zero, so you can uh, work out which ones are which and you don't uh, create ones that are the same. And they have the VAT on them, which is crucial because a lot of the accounting system that you have will do for you is calculate your VAT at the end. So you want to make sure that you understand when you're spending money or taking in money that the right VAT is coded on it. So it all calculates it for you at the end of the quarter. Uh, we've just got a few uh, example uh, categories or charts of accounts here. As you can see, the interest income taking from a bar. This was quite a particular business as an events business so we had bars we had venues we had stock and drinks as well this is a quite a complicated one but with a street food business you just keep it very simple um so uh you've got your accounting software and you've kind of worked out that you've got an accountant then you might want to be talking to your accountant about what kind of structure does a street food business uh need to be uh, or, or, or what, what do you want? And this will depend on your circumstances, and that's why it's really good to, to talk to an accountant about it, because it, it, these are it's a very particular set of circumstances. Because with sole trader or partnership, your money and the business's money are the same. So essentially, you'll just do 
a basic tax return at the end. That you are one and the same. You might be earning money from another job, uh, and then you're just a part-time uh, trader on the side. Maybe you're doing weekends or farmers markets or the odd night market. But you're just, you're just testing the water. At this point, it's probably quite good to be a sole trader because the money for the business and your money is all the same. You file one tax return at the end. As you might be thinking about getting more serious about it, you might want to become a limited company. That will mean that you have to do more accounting work. You will have to file quarterly uh, uh, end of year accounts. Uh, if you're VAT registered, you'll have to do quarterly VAT returns. Uh, and th this is for a company that is basically a little bit bigger. When you want to take that next step and think, actually, now I'm going to put some serious time in here. Maybe you've bought some assets for that company. Uh, and limited companies are good to build if you want to protect against any losses that the company might uh, incur, where a sole trader will have complete liability if you end up having uh, a large bills to pay as a sole trader business, that will influence uh, the liability you have as a whole person. Whereas a limited company, you do have the protection of being a business and being able to dissolve that business if the worst case happens. So I, I really recommend starting as a sole trader, but over, over time thinking, I want to make a deal of this. I want to make a limited company and then talk again to your accountant about how to structure that. And there is something called a partnership LLP, which is essentially a sort of merging of a partnership with a company. It's a limited liability partnership. So uh, it does protect you and your partner uh, against any losses that may be incurred if, if things don't go as well as planned. And and for any of those types of businesses, how how would uh, how does someone register their company? Like, what is what is what can I do right now to register myself as a sole trader or a limited company? So, with a sole trader, it's it, you basically just it's a if you're a freelancer, you're essentially a sole trader. So, uh, you just register with the YouGov website as a self-assessed uh, person that you need to do a tax return at the end of the year. That's going on the YouGov website and finding yourself that you require to do a self-assessment. Uh, with becoming a limited company, you will need to go on company's house and you create a company. Uh, you'll have to create a name of that company. You'll be given a company number. Uh, but ultimately, that's what happens. You'll have to create a share structure, which sounds a bit weird at the beginning. But essentially, it's up to you if, if you want to have 10,000 shares or just one share. Most people in small businesses just have one share for each person in it, uh, but it's up to you. And, and because you've created the company, you kind of get to create the rules uh, in terms of how many shares, because it's all down to you. But go on Companies House, I think it costs about 30 to 40 pounds, and it's very easy. A lot of companies out there will charge you a lot more to try and set it up for you, but go online, go on Companies House, go find the bit that says start a new company. It will be a lot easier than you think. Great. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, and here we go. Uh, this is probably the biggest uh, roadblock in growing a street food business. Uh, in a lot of any, any food business, really, it's a very difficult part of it, and that's VAT. So it's 20% of all your revenue, essentially, once you register. You're only qualifying for to be needing to register for VAT once you've taken £85,000 of turnover in a 12-month period. So if you've got £85,000 of sales, you know, it may have slightly varied. It's still around that figure, but it varies different to context. But once you've sold £85,000 worth of food or, or anything else that you're selling, you will have to register uh, with, the, with the VAT uh, at HMRC. Uh, and that is at any 12 month period. So it's not a tax year based thing. It all depends on the level of turnover. So that's where we, we, we really do not recommend people register straight, in, straight away, even though you may have invested a lot of money in the van at the beginning. It's hard building a street food business. And while you might be thinking, oh, I'm gonna start straight away and I'm gonna be turning over that 85 grand in three months, uh, it might be a lot harder and if you're registered straight away, you will start immediately. You'll have to be paying 20% to the, to the HMRC for VAT. Yeah, um, and, and you never know what's going to happen, right? Just like 
well, what's happening now? You know, yeah. and uh, yeah, then you'd be yeah, you may have taken some money. Uh, while with coronavirus, they have delayed a lot of VAT payments for a year. Uh, if you were ready, if you just started your company and you've been trading for half of March, you would still be liable for that twenty percent of that those takings in March uh, next year. Where if you hadn't registered, you would be liable for nothing. So it's a, it's really crucial. And Rob, can I ask you, like, why why does VAT hurt street food businesses, especially like maybe more than other um, other businesses? Well, I think it, a lot of food businesses really suffer from it. Street food is particular because there is, there aren't many costs associated with street food in the same way as other restaurants, and you still your costs stay fixed. Uh, and essentially, uh, when you start making some money, as soon as you go over that twenty uh, eighty five thousand, you're losing all that twenty percent. And what other businesses might gain from that, from going registered, is claiming back the VAT on their expenses. So that's how your VAT return is calculated. It's the twenty percent on your turnover taken off, uh, and then you minus what you've had to spend on VAT in your supply chain. So if you spend on a pitch fee or an event, you might spend uh, five hundred pounds on VAT for an expensive festival. You can claim that back against the VAT return. But with street food businesses, most of the food is not vatable, uh, so you're not paying any VAT. There's nothing to claim back on that food, uh, and for staffing, which is another big cost for street food, you're not claiming any VAT back on that. And you might claim a small amount on your on your rent, but that's about it. So whereas a lot of other businesses, when they become VAT registered, they're while they're losing 20% of their turnover, they might be saving themselves 10% on cost um, uh, over the variation of what they're spending money on. But uh, with the street food businesses, you're ultimately just really losing your revenue. And that can really hurt. And it can be a very psychologically difficult thing to accept when you're trying to build a small food business. And it is a lot of work. It's loads of work. Uh, and you get to a point where you think this is growing, this is growing. Yeah, uh, it'll be brilliant, and then boom. Okay, so it's, a, it's something. It's something that if you're start looking to start straight away, you don't have to think about as much right now. But it's something good to keep in mind for the future when you when you get to that point to manage it in in the best way that you can. I, I would always think about it because if you're you're you've got to. You've got to have in your head, if you cannot make money from your business uh, post-VAT, your business isn't that viable as a business. So it is the, the VAT threshold for it is, is almost like a bit of a subsidy for small businesses, giving them a little bit of extra capital to get going. But ultimately, if you want a stable business, you are going to have to factor this in. So when you're thinking about food costs, menus, any kind of uh, inputs to your business, you always need to keep VAT in mind okay thanks uh, again uh, ask your accountant and there's a very nifty way of calculating vat uh for instance 10 the vat in 10 pounds taking so if you price something at 10 pounds you'll only take uh eight pounds 33 uh very neat way of, of calculating it. and as i've probably said in every slide so far mainly just remember to get an accountant <laughs> it's a huge thing uh, because you need to be able to have someone sounding out. If, you, if you've got a lot of financial knowledge already, maybe you could just have one sort of uh, a friend might be able to help you, but the best street food businesses get this right at the beginning, and they do that by getting some support. Cool. All right, so now I've sort of gone through the, the overview of the business. Uh, now we're going to sort of do a focus in on food itself and how you cost a menu item, how you understand, like, whether or not you can price something at six pounds, four pounds, or, or whatever. Uh, this is a very basic uh, version of it, and it can become a lot more complicated, and that's down to you. But just want to go through the basic elements of it. So the inputs of a dish would essentially be the food, the package, the condiments, the labour in prepping, and cooking materials, which may not you may not see on the plate, but such as oil if you're cooking fried chicken another cooking material so you've got to think about all these things when you're costing up your food and 
as I used to work for Bleaker Burger for many years, I went for a burger. And it's also very simple. It's like street food Duplo. Everything's <laughs> nicely, <laughs> nicely uh, sectioned out for you. There's no, yeah. not too complicated. So as you can see here, you've got the bun. Uh, in my head, I'm spending 35p on the bun. I've worked out my lettuce cost, but uh, it's about a penny because I'm paying one pound for a few lettuces and I've divided up how many lettuces, uh, how many burgers I get out of each lettuce. Uh, 3p for a tomato. Again, I've, I've cut up a tomato, worked out how much one tomato costs and divided it by how many burgers it can make. Cheese again, 2p. That's American cheese, so it's pretty cheap. Uh, sauce, I've maybe I'm just buying in some burger sauce, maybe, or I'm making my own, and I've calculated that that cost for that sauce is 3p, and then you've got onions, uh, and then meat here, I've put one pound, and what I've done there is I've put ready-made in brackets, because what I might be paying one pound uh, for my meat, for each patty of burger meat, but it's coming to me as a ready-made burger to put straight on the grill. You might find that you could get meat cheaper than that for the same weight in meat for 70p per burger. But what this has done is that I'm buying it for £1 ready-made, so I'm saving on any labour time in prepping that burger meat. It's ready to go. I can put it straight on the grill, season it, absolutely fine. Uh, and that's worth, worth it because I know as soon as I rock up to a market or an event, I've got all my ingredients and I can start cooking burgers really, really quickly. Um, the box, uh, it's 5p. You've got to put your packaging price in because what we're trying to do here is everything that you would give to the customer, what price, how much does that thing cost? So the burger in the box with the napkin. How much does that cost? So we're pricing in the box for 5p and napkins at a penny. That is probably a wild, uh, wildly expensive napkin. I think they're probably more like 0 .0, 0 0.0 penny, but we'll just get for ease of maths, we'll go for a penny. Oh, one second. Uh, the total of that is £1.51. So if you add all those inputs together, so the burger itself in a box with a napkin costs me £1.51. Uh, so now we'll move on to the next thing, which is the fries. So the fries, we've got potatoes. Maybe, maybe we're going to uh, Booker's and just buying the old uh, ready-made fries that we can put straight into the uh, oil. Uh, we hope not. Everyone likes proper cooked fries, and I recommend doing them yourself. But in this example, we've got frozen fries. We put them in the fryer, and including the oil, those single fries cost 30p per portion. So we worked out a rough weight of how, how many fries go in a portion. Uh, 5p again for the box and 1p for the napkin. And then we've got to think about ketchup. So I've once tried to sell fries at a festival when I'd run out of ketchup and it was almost a mutiny on me. People said I should be ashamed of myself for selling fries. <laughs> You've got to cost that in because people will go mad uh, if they don't have ketchup or you sell them chips. It's just something about the culture of our island. Uh, and if you add it all up, uh, it's there's seven p. Um, so that's your portion of fries. It costs yourself thirty seven p. So. What does that all mean? Uh, I have then sat down, priced what I think the market will uh, pay for my burger and fries. And I'm using very good, good ingredients. And I think my burger can be priced at £6.50 because uh, I'm using very good ingredients, good meat. And my fries can be priced at £3. So, and that's including VAT. So that's the price the customer will pay uh, for my burger and fries. And I've also put in a meal deal there to attract customers uh, to get a saving if they buy both burger and fries. That's what most people will want. And I've put that as £9, so they say 50p. So if you then look down on the bottom line, price expat, you've got the actual money that the business is going to get uh, if this business is that registered, which it will eventually be. Uh, so the burger is giving me, if I sell it for six fifty, five pounds forty two, and I'm getting two fifty for the fries. And the meal deal is seven fifty. So you can see there, there's quite a stark difference between 
the price that a customer is paying and the and the money that the business is receiving after VAT. So you can see why it can really take businesses by surprise how much they need to develop in order to get through this. Yeah, but we've costed up the burger. The burger is one pound fifty one. We've already done that. The prize is zero point thirty seven pounds, and then we've got a meal deal. We've added up those two. Uh, costs for the burger and fries and that's one pound 88 so for each item we get a profit at the bottom so as you can see the profit for a six pound 50 burger is three pounds 91 so i mean it's just a little bit over 50 percent of the price um so you can see that the burger is not making us much money there the fries on the other hand we're selling them for three pounds and we're getting two pounds thirteen profit, so that's that's much better. The fries are, are what making is making us money, uh, and then the meal deal is a combination. We're losing a little bit, but we're getting more income, getting more money per customer if we can get them to buy both. Um, so it that sort of breaks it down. This is the calculation that I generally work to. I think uh, so. You cost divided by price times a hundred gives you that percentage of of how much your price if you're selling at 10 pounds uh, and you've got uh, and your price uh, and your burger costs you one pound 50 that's 15 percent cost on the price uh, and we always put the target between 15 and 30 percent but to be honest these days with rents and business rates getting higher and higher i'm seeing it a lot harder to for businesses to remain at 30 percent unless you've got cheaper things like the uh like the fries you it's hard to sell products at a 30 percent margin yeah so the other the other day um tim from that Na- from namban your good friend um he was saying that he he, he can't price a dish like his beef tataki at 25 pounds so he looked at the actual cash he made as a profit rather than as a percentage um and uh, so I just thought it might be interesting for anyone who is watching to see like the different ways of thinking about what to do. Yeah, and it, I think with uh, when you, if, if you've got other dishes that have got good margins, as a food business, you you almost want to be like drawing people in with with a really good deal. And if you if you're cooking a product that costs you thirty percent of its price or even more. You might, if you can model it right, but in order, to, it's very risky doing this. But if you've got the, the numbers straight in your head, you could be like, well, this is a loss leader almost. You're selling something that's quite expensive for a business at quite a low price. Uh, and it will draw people in and people get really excited about it. And then they'll buy other things that will actually yeah. make the money. Uh, yeah. That's a little bit like our burger business here is that the burgers costing 28%. As you can see in the calculations, it's it's pretty expensive, uh, but the fries are at fifteen percent, so it's on the other end of our spectrum that we just mentioned, uh, and then the meal deal is sort of sitting in the middle. Uh, so it's it's working because the, the two products balance each other out, uh, and as, as once we get those sales going and people engage in the burger because it, it may be quite expensive uh, to, to for us to make, but it's what makes gets people the customers chips fries you can buy them anywhere if you just set up a chip a fry stall with just regular old book of fries or even if you made them yourself you're probably not going to get many customers unless you're in a perfect location so you need something to draw the customer in so you can't be afraid from uh like putting money in into quality ingredients because you will need that to make customers because there's a very competitive market out there but you've got to think about it instead of a diversity in, of your menu Mm-hmm. Um, as you can see, we're, if you look at the whole average of the of the menu that we've just done, twenty two point six is quite high. You could even try and get that down if you can. Uh, I think some of the costs that I've put in there are pretty high. Uh, so even even just a few pennies can really uh, get that margin down uh, because and, and make you a lot of money over a year. So yeah. the tighter you get on these numbers and the the way that you bring your cost of sales down over a year. It might only sound like 20 feet portion, but over a year, that, that's thousands of pounds that go straight to your bottom line, straight into your back pocket Yeah, uh, to reinvest in the business or pay yourself a dividend. Yeah. 
and that that's why it's good to to when you're setting up a business you can look at different places to find ingredients and like start relationships with suppliers and just that one or two p on something that you use continually can make a really big difference at the end of a year yeah it's a huge difference and then a, a, a lot of traders that we find that everything's quite relaxed uh, in terms of these costs they're not defining them as much they're not controlling them as much because there's they, because they're only trading three times a week, maybe a few lunch times, they're doing quite a lot of portions, but the risks are quite low. When you start taking on seven-day-a-week operations and uh, you see a lot of traders having to really define these and really start getting these margins down. And even something like feeding your staff, I recommend everyone allows their staff to eat the food if they're working hard for you. But you've got to work out exactly how much that's costing you because a burger, a shift with 10 uh, employees eating that burger over a year that could start costing you ten thousand uh, pounds so it's just making conscious choices and if you really drill into these numbers that's what it allows your business to do it makes you get to make like adult decisions about every single thing that's happening uh, by considering the data and what actually consequences might be of making those decisions so our burger business is doing pretty well but if you were doing something completely different, like a curry, this is, I think, a picture of Spice Box curry. Big shout out to them. It's delicious. Uh, and it's a lot harder to define because look at the ingredients lists on the right, on the left. Uh, so many more ingredients going in than our burger. Our burger was very simple, really easy uh, to understand. You could see all the components and the costs right there where with all the spices and the, and the various inputs into a curry, for instance, it's gonna it's a lot harder to get your head around. And then you've also got the labour cost. So if you're paying a staff member an hour of uh, work of wage uh, to make the curries to do the prep before your event or your market, that's got to be factored into your cost because that's costing you money. That's costing the business money, and that's going straight into that product. Uh, it's quite hard to sometimes separate that out, but you've got to really try and work it out because it's the difference between understanding your costs and not. And then you've got portion control. I mean, I remember a trader that was uh, had a model. They were expanding, and they thought they were getting 50 portions out, out of their batches of curry that they were making, but they were only getting 30. And they almost went bust because they weren't on top of this. Uh, and it, it's very easy theoretically to think, oh, we, everyone's going to get 20 portions out of this much curry. But yeah. unless you've got a way of weighing it, that's what I used to work at Leon. Leon weigh everything. I think they do that in McDonald's. Uh, or, or you've got a very good like spoon mechanism or something like that. You've got to really, really think about how you define that. Okay. Uh, um, just just to let just to let you know, Rob, we've gone over a bit, but it's okay. I'm just going to say for like another 10 minutes, if that's okay. All right, all right. So we'll yeah. speed up a little bit. It's, yeah. It's, Thank you. Uh, no, this is this is gold. Like this to so many people. I just I want to make sure everyone gets that information. So thanks. No, brilliant. Oh, let's carry on. We're we're not too far off. Uh, so last thing is just prep kitchen. If you do a lot of prep, you will need to have to pay for kitchen space. If you're a market stall that buys all their food in and can do a bit of prep on the stall, it does save you a lot of time and money. Uh, you might not need a prep kitchen. Uh, prep kitchens can be quite cheap. I mean, I know some people that pay about £500 a month and it's quite nice to have a base for your business anyway. So what is the startup cost? So I think from speaking to people, you, I think five grand is pretty much the minimum you can do for a gazebo setup on a, in street food, but it completely depends on what businesses you, you want to start up. If you're selling a burger, uh you and you're doing chips you might need to buy a deep fat fryer a gazebo you might need to get a van five grand for the basic equipment flooring uh gazebo structures uh you should be able to get away with that but you are going to need more money than that that's just for the for the actual structure and the equipment uh vans generally about thirty thousand, a lot more expensive a lot more money up front but is does save you lots of time and effort uh, as I said before, it's really relative to your plan, whatever you whatever you want to cook. Uh, you need to cost in when you're thinking about startup costs. How much do I need the money to to, to uh, pull the trigger on your business? You need to think I might not make any money 
from this for six months and see what kind of uh, revenue you can live on in terms of your household. Because if you don't think about that, you could easily just have slightly too big a dreams and then come a cropper when you realize, oh, it's a lot harder than I thought. Yeah, And you might have had a really good idea, but it doesn't go anywhere. And then this is big, big one. I mean, a lot of traders never really ever had a, an actual goal, but I always say don't chase the money, chase the goal, because you've got to really think about what you want to do. If you want a restaurant, don't street food might not be a place to make money in the meantime. You might want to sell something for a bit cheaper, lower your costs so you can break into the market and then really get people eating your food. Because if you really want a restaurant, the biggest thing for you right now as a street food trader is getting more and more people eating and talking about your food. That's the goal. It's not trying to make an extra £10 each time you trade because the, 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 that £10 is not worth that much to your long-term goal. Yeah. I always I th always think of um, at one of our last workshops, we had Tucker um, who came through our incubator program and the approach that they took was we're you know, we're going to get a van and we're going to invest this much and we're going to do it for a year. So at the end of that year, if it doesn't work or they're not enjoying it, they could just, they can sell the van, they can make some of that money back and then they can just decide every six months if they want to keep going, if they want to still doing that. Yeah, it's a really uh, sort of uh, well-rounded idea about why they went into the business, what they wanted to do. And, and they clearly had enjoyment as a big factor of why they wanted to. I think they both, I remember talking to them originally, I think I did a consultation with them and they came from quite corporate jobs and they really just wanted to leave that and have fun. But now, now they're at food halls and street feast and they're, and they're building quite a good business, but it's difficult because they're a burger and they don't know where to go next. Uh, and you've always got to think about that because it, it, it's quite easy just to get stuck in a limbo with street food if you're not careful. Uh, waste. Uh, you're going to waste food. Uh, it's almost impossible not to because you've got to uh, work out whether or not you are going to have enough portions to sell to the people. Uh, and you've got to constantly work out, am I going to sell 200 tomorrow? Am I going to sell 100 tomorrow? Am I going to sell 50? Oh, no, it's raining. I'm going to sell 10. It's really hard. A lot of people develop a sixth sense. I used to have a chef who never wasted anything because he just, I don't know, I feel like he had some kind of <laughs> Google data on what people were going to do in their eating habits every day at the South Bank. Uh, we, yeah, we never wasted anything. Uh, and if you've got high-risk products, always, like, that cost a lot of money, like fish, always maybe go a little bit under because you don't want to be wasting that fish. And if you're cooking batches, sometimes you might want to just sacrifice the last five portions of a day rather than cook a whole 30 portion dish because you might not be able to reuse it. Yeah. You've got to factor these costs in on waste. You always try and work out how much food you might be wasting because it does affect the amount of money that you'll be making long term. Yeah. Uh, costs to trade. Uh, this is where I uh, love Curb and the fact that we've really stuck to our guns on this we charge 15 percent plus that on gross takings there's wildly different charge rates on all sorts of different events and markets some offering a flat fee uh we we make money at curve if you make money uh if it rains we take a hit you take it we're all in it together it's all in everyone's interests to make that market work and that's why I like percentages. There's been a lot of really high percentages going on on, on large events, sometimes even 30%. It's very hard to make money in those circumstances. And uh, it's difficult uh, to, to, to be able to do that. And if you're a new trader, do not take a, a rent of 30% because it's really, you have to sell a lot of food to make any money on that. Uh, flat, flat fees are really good if you know the event and it's got a history. But flat fees are often used by inexperienced event organisers to make money for their event when they're not really thinking about the food and who's going to buy it. They don't really have an idea of the fact that in order for you to spend £400, they need to, you need to have about 1,000 customers over a weekend or something. In their head, they're just thinking, oh, we'll put a pitch over there, pitch over there, pitch over there. Uh, 
uh, often they'll add utilities on as well so you need to make sure you read the small print if you need lots of power in your if you've got lots of equipment that need lots of plugs that can end up costing you a lot often power can be more expensive than the actual rent uh, and most traders go by the rule five times the rental price is what you need to take so if you pay a hundred pounds you need to be taking roughly about 500 to 600 pounds uh, at the market uh, just to sort of break even at an absolute minimum uh, um, you think you can do that if you can think you can take the five if you can easily make uh, five times the rental price it's probably a, a, an event worth doing um, when it comes to these uh, kind of fees can you negotiate oh yes especially you can really negotiate and I recommend always negotiating never take the first price uh, always. and the more the more press you've got the more inquiries you've got obviously you're gonna feel more confident about negotiating and it is one of as your business gets bigger you will be able to negotiate because they yeah. will be there but even from early on always negotiate especially if it's a uh, an event with quite a short turnaround so if say if they're asking you about a month before they really need to fill that pitch and eventually they're going to work out that they'd rather take a price on the uh on their income rather than uh just leave it empty and that's yeah. when you negotiate going switching for a flat fee plus a percentage which is a model out there quite regularly yeah. pay 100 that plus 15 percent yeah, that's and that's why we, the fact that we keep it fifteen percent, like we don't really need to negotiate because we're in it together. Like we're we go, you know, we do well if you do well. Yeah, and 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 that's ultimately the thing. Sometimes you have a percentage model, and you got to remember why does the event want you there? There's loads of different events that have inflated sense of how many people are going to eat at their event, or how many people are coming, what are the ticket sales of that event, and while, while if it is a 15% model, if it's a large event, maybe a festival or something, you still are sinking a lot of money in before you even get there. So you've really, really got to think in any kind of rent, uh, any kind of event that you're doing, why you've been asked to trade there, what service are you actually offering, uh, how many other traders are there, how what the shape of the site's going to look like. Are you going to be placed in a weird place where no one's really going to go? You've got to think about all these things before really taking on uh, a big event. Uh, yeah, so rent, rents are a big cost in street food, but they're always very easy to negotiate on. Staff, uh, as I said before, I'll go back to the burger traders. With a burger trader, you're cooking everything fresh. So you, while you save on the prep cost of staff time having to prep the food, you spend a lot during service because you need a lot of people cooking the fries, the burgers, the buns, sending the money out, sending the burgers out, taking the money. Uh, you need a lot of staff to get 100 burgers out quickly. Where a curry trader, they may have spent a lot more money on staff prepping the curry, but they might only need two people spooning out rice and curry. Uh, staffing in London and the UK was getting harder. I mean, right now we have no idea what kind of landscape hospitality is going to result in post uh, coronavirus but uh there, it was a, there was a real shortage of staff uh we really recommend paying london living wage uh because it, it it does help the industry and it, it's just people need me need to be paid well uh, and they all work really hard and if you can get people on payroll with coronavirus we've seen how many businesses have been able to offer offer the government's uh, job retention schemes to those people who have put them on payroll yeah. where, and zero hour contracts because where some people there is there is a culture of quite flexible staffing so uh, if you've got really good people try and keep them um, paying yourself this is a really crucial uh, element uh, you've got to work out how much you can afford to live off uh, most people will take a tax-free amount if they have a limited company they can take pay themselves 800 pounds a month and then pay themselves from dividends and that's the profits of the company uh, and when you get an accountant you can talk to them about whether or not how you can pay yourself through that uh, obviously your business in a street food world is your life so you probably are 
use you're you're working a lot of the time so you will be able to put some of your phone bill contribution if you're using your house as an office you might you might be able to claim on that so there's lots of different things that you can do to sort of offset your tax using dividends but we really recommend getting on payway as soon as you feel comfortable because right now again with coronavirus you've got a job retention scheme if you're a director of that company but you're paying yourself a wage and you've got no work you could take up the job retention scheme offered by the government uh, and it just it there's a big problem with street food traders where they kind of don't pay themselves much and uh, then they come they they, they think they're building a business but they're not costing their time into the business enough yeah and if they don't do that they don't really know how that business is working like when you incorporate all of its costs and all of the energy going into it so it's quite crucial that that that, that you have that uh costed into your your what you're doing um yeah and so it's take your money you've earned and invest it in assets if, you, if you're not built, if you're not constantly reinvesting, if you don't want a restaurant, a lot of people in street food will invest money. If they're doing well, they'll try and invest it. And people do buy houses and things if they can. It's very hard. You have to have a long trading history, but you can do it if you, if you really want to. Income streams. There's lots of different ways of making money in street food. Uh, you've got pub residencies. Often don't make much money, but can save you costs in terms of prep kitchens and give your brand a base. Supper clubs, great marketing campaign, and you can make a one-off good chunk of money if you do it well. Markets are great, especially when the weather's good. Same with night markets, a bit more of an evening trade, uh, and quite a lot of engaged people go to mar- night markets. They're really engaged in your food. It's not just markets at lunch can sometimes be, not curved ones, but uh, functional. They're not really engaging in your brand uh, or anything like that if you do want to build a further restaurant uh you've got events trading events like bst and fest and then you've got festivals uh we do a lot of at curb a lot of prepaid corporate events which are really good because you get paid a thousand pounds for the day uh, and you know exactly how much money you're going to make and how many portions you need to do and then a lot of our traders have done sources and retail products the rib man probably being the most successful with his holy fuck sauce yeah. which is brilliant but you've got to watch out for it uh, other costs <laughs> You got van costs, you got gas, petrol. You're always going to be buying kitchen equipment. You can never stop buying it. This bits will become your one and only favorite store. You need to get insurance, public liability insurance. That's going to cost you uh, a certain amount per month, depending on what you're cooking. Recommend that you get a website. You're going to have to pay for that. Marketing, you might want to do uh, elements of that. You might want to get a photographer wrapped down. We really recommend everyone gets photographers, get professional shots. That's going to cost you money. And again, I put you again. Uh, you've got to cost the owner of the business into the, the business plan. Like how much can you live off? And really think about that because it will help you. Because there's a lot of highs and lows in street food. And if you're surviving in your household and that's not stressing you out, it will keep you uh, energetically ready to k- continue the, facing the challenges of your business. Uh, I did not quote this. Uh, <laughs> this is one of the most like churned out sayings. Turnover is vanity, profit is sanity, cash is reality. Cash really, especially right now with coronavirus, cash really is everything. What you've got in your bank uh, really, really is what you need to really hold on to and work out. A lot of people end up paying when they're new to this, paying invoices as soon as they get them. Don't pay them on their due date. Hold as much cash as you can at all times. Can't recommend that enough. Thank you. Um, uh, final, final bit, uh, forecasting. Something you will want to do when you can. Talk to your accountant about it. But it's just basically mapping out how much income you're going to get, costs and profit, and then hopefully cash flow. So all of these things, turnover, profit and cash, can be planned and you can set yourself targets. So you know what success looks like in three months' time. And that's a key thing. Great. Thank you so much, Rob. That was amazing whistle stop tour through finances. Um, If you had one piece of advice for people watching us today, what would it be? Get zero and get an accountant. Great. Yeah, definitely. Get someone supporting you in making that system work because it will give you more information about your business. Yeah. Anything else. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us, Rob. Really appreciate it.